Good evening, and on behalf of the University of Melbourne, welcome to the 2011 A.N. Smith Lecture in Journalism. My name is Glenn Davis, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands in which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and pay respects to elders past and present. The annual A.N. Smith Lecture in Journalism is a long and honoured tradition at this university. It commemorates the journalist Arthur Norman Smith, who was a founder of the Australian Journalists Association and its first general president. Mr. Smith was also one of the founding members of the Federal Parliamentary Gallery from 1901 to 1927. As a reporter, he was a detached observer of the ways and words of politicians, describing, for example, the early Prime Minister Alfred Deakin as, quote, not a great constructive statesman, but at least easy to understand because, quote, he always said the same thing three times in different language. The first A.N. Smith lecture was held in 1938, and of recent years, the university has been delighted to welcome an eminent succession of speakers to deliver this important occasion, including Michelle Grattan, Peter Beatty, Don Watson, Rupert Murdoch, Fred Hilmer, Bob Hawke, and Maxine McHugh, amongst many others. The 2008 A.N. Smith lecture was on the topic, Do Newspapers Have a Future? And How Long Is That Future? It was delivered by Michael Gawenda, former editor of The Age and now senior fellow at the Centre for Advanced Journalism here at the university. In 2009, the lecture was delivered by Mark Scott, managing director of the ABC, and was provocatively devoted to the topic, The Fall of Rome, Media After Empire. And last year, this lively tradition was continued by well-known online journalist Annabel Crabb, who spoke on the end of journalism as we know it. Now, despite the gloom cumulatively in these titles, I'm pleased to report that at least at the end of 2011, we've not yet reached the end of history, as far as either journalism or the media is concerned. And indeed, tonight's lecture promises to take us into exciting and perhaps equally provocative territory. The 2011 A.N. Smith Lecture in Journalism will be delivered by Greg Highwood, and I'm delighted to welcome him back to the university this evening. Greg is the CEO of Fairfax Media, publisher of The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Canberra Times and The Australian Financial Review, amongst many other newspaper titles and media interests. Early in his career, Greg was an economics graduate before being hired as a cadet journalist on the Financial Review by its then editor, Max Walsh. As a walker, he won, as a reporter, he won a Walkley Award <laughs> and rose to become editor, then publisher and editor-in-chief of the Australian Financial Review. He held a number of other major posts within the Fairfax organisation, including publisher and editor-in-chief of The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald before taking a Victorian government position as Executive Director for Policy and Cabinet in the Department of the Premier in 2003. He worked in a number of government roles until 2010, and uh, then, early this year, he was confirmed in his position as Chief Executive and Managing Director of Fairfax Media. And tonight, Greg Highwood will probe the question of journalism's relevance, particularly when newspaper companies uh, can no longer rely on classified advertising as their rivers of gold to keep them in publication. Many people have predicted a bleak future for journalism in the current climate, so it will be extraordinarily interesting to hear the view of Fairfax Media's chief executive. He will speak to the topic, if you ask me about the future of newspapers, you have asked the wrong question. Please welcome Greg Highwood. Well, thank you very much, uh, Glyn, and uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Uh, it's an honour to present uh, the 2011 A.N. Smith Lecture on Journalism. Uh, this lecture holds a special place for us all, uh, and over the years there have been critical thinkers and leaders standing at this lectern, and uh, I'm honoured to be among them. For anyone in this room who joins us tonight for their first A.N. Smith lecture, Arthur Norman Smith was, as Glyn alluded to, a founder of the Australian Journalists Association and served as its first 
General Secretary and five years um, as President. Uh, and of course, uh, we have this lecture because the family, in his honour, endowed a full £200 to the university. So that £200, Glyn, has gone a long, long way. <laughs> uh, the first A.N. Smith lecture in journalism was held in 1938, and uh, I doubt there will be reasons to stop, pause, or think about this journalism for uh, at least a similar period in the future. Uh, it is an endlessly fascinating subject, and the community is, as it should be, interested in who reports on what and why. The timing of this year's lecture should, uh, could not be more appropriate. No one in this, in this room has any doubt about the speed change in the, media, in the media industry. And last week certainly underlined the point. The changing of the guard at News Limited and the Fairfax family effectively leaving the Fairfax Media Register are in many ways quite profound. I would like to pay homage to the extraordinary contribution of John Hartigan to journalism, to the media. He was a man of Australia and he had great qualities. He was a true journalist. He fought for and defended freedom of the press as a personal passion. He's done more than simply mouth the words. He has led the campaigns. He is, at his core, an honourable man. His successor, Kim Williams, is an individual of unquestioned intellect and ability, and News Limited, under his leadership, will remain a formidable and welcome competitor. And to Fairfax, the decision of John Fairfax and his family to sell their significant interest in Fairfax media is an important moment and needs to be marked. When it occurred last Thursday, my chairman and I were both full of praise and respect for the family as founders and as passionate news people. They are a family who has championed independent journalism. We, in return, appreciated their words of support for the company and for particularly for their words about our strategy. Fairfax Media has a strategy, a strategy that is demonstrably working. We are well progressed on our journey of change, change from a traditional old-style media company to a modern and smart media company. And ladies and gentlemen, we have no doubt, and you should have no doubt, that we are a smart media company. Our metropolitan newspapers, The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Canberra Times, now account for merely 20 per cent of our revenue. The balance is made up by our growing digital businesses and our strong regional and agricultural businesses. Our readership has never been greater. And at the very heart, the very core of our strategy is our journalism, and that is what I want to talk to you about tonight. The chicken and littles out there, and dare I say there's probably some in this room, bemoan the end of media companies as we know them. Some worry about the current chaos created by the cacophony of voices on the net and have nightmares about a brave new world without us. There are others, of course, who wonder whether life without us would be a blessing. All wonder about whether the role of journalist is over. Well, as the teaser for you tonight, I said, if you ask me the future about, uh, ask me about the future of newspapers, you have asked the wrong question. I believe the future of journalism has never looked stronger, and this is because of the internet, not despite of it. The future of journalism should not be confused, as it has been, with the future of print. Journalism can be, live, be delivered in any number of ways – online, smartphone, iPad, IPTV. And journalism at Fairfax is, as I said, at the centre of a smart news business. This has not always been the case. In the so-called good old days, when newspapers were a licence to print money, the journalism was an added extra, delivered by the proprietors to leverage political and social influence and, in some cases, a dollop of public good. The business in those days was classified advertising. 
They made the money. They drove the business. But not anymore. At our annual general meeting last week, I said BHP might produce minerals, Coca-Cola amateur beverages. At Fairfax, we produce journalism. Once I would have had to have said classified advertising. Now I say journalism. In last year's A.N. Smith lecture, the talented Annabelle Crabb focused on her new digital journal, journal experience. If you would indulge me briefly, I would like to take you through my journal, my journey, a journalist a bit older than Annabelle, the old to the new media, and why I think that great independent journalism has never had a stronger future. Now, my early career sounds like it's straight out of the script of the front page with a unique Australian twist. My first day was at 392 Little Collins Street in Melbourne. Fairfax had a Melbourne office called, appropriately, Fairfax House. Housed in Fairfax House was not the age. That was up at the end of Spencer Street. It was the Financial Review and the now defunct National Times, or defunct in its print form. So I arrived at, uh, in January 1976, uh, I was at young, <laughs> January 1976 at 392 Little Collins Street at about 10am. I thought this was a pretty good job, you could start at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I knocked on the front door, it was opened, I went in and Trevor Sykes, Pierpont columnist extraordinaire, one of the great financial journalists, was Melbourne bureau chief. And he said, welcome to the Financial Review. And he called Bob Mills, who was the industrial relations reporter over. And he said to Bob, take Greg to the branch office. Now, being the Financial Review, I thought that we must be going to the stock exchange, which in those days was a physical entity in Collins Street. But rather than walk up the hill towards Queen Street, we walked down the street to, towards Elizabeth Street and straight into the front bar of the Grosvenor Hotel. <laughs> this was before, 10 past, for, oh, before 5 past 10. They kept me there until 5pm in the afternoon. They took it in waves, buying beer after beer after beer. And you can imagine at the age of, I think, 21, at 5pm after drinking all day, I was in pretty rough shape. But Trevor came down at the last wave, bought me the last beer, pushed me out the door and said, today we've taught you to drink, tomorrow we teach you to type, which they never did. <laughs> which in fact, a few weeks later, the Sydney office rang Trevor and said, Greg's come out of Monash University, hasn't had any training as a journalist. There's a new course at RMIT in journalism we think he should go. So Trevor called me in and said, now, Sydney said that you should go to this new course in journalism. Uh, you can go, but I'm a bit short-staffed, and if you go, I'll sack you. <laughs> so that was the Fairfax view of training in those days. It was called the deep end, which is, there's the deep end, jump in. It was an ent entirely different environment. They were heady days, they were relaxed days. Fairfax then was huge. It was much bigger than News Limited. It had the Age, the Sydney Morning Herald, the AFR. It had the Seven Network. It had the Macquarie Radio Network. It owned Sun Reviewer magazines, Women's Day. It had its regional newspaper network. The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald had a monopoly in classifieds and they made five million dollars profit each every Saturday. You could basically go to the pub secure that unless you didn't perform, you would keep your job. Advertisers had very little alternative. If you wanted to advertise, you could advertise in the paper, on TV and in a handful of magazines. And that was it. That was the media. Now, for the next 20 years of my career, not much changed. Fairfax, certainly Fairfax was broken up in 1987 when Jan Warwick, Fairfax's fair, um, takeover bid fell apart and Paul Keating legislated to make sure that the old Fairfax 
could never be put back together again. His Queen of Screen, of Queen of Screen Prince of Print legislation, which meant that you couldn't hold the agglomeration of, print asset, of, of media assets that you could. But the business model did not change. The fundamental business model of media in those days did not change. It was based upon the rivers of gold and monopoly of print classified advertising. What this meant in reality was that if you lived in Sydney or Melbourne and you wanted a job, a home, a car, a boat, a bike, you wanted to attend a garage sale or see a band, a movie, a play, or for some odd reason bid for a government tender, you had to read The Age or the Sydney Morning Herald. There was no effective alternative. Every Friday night, massive printing presses would produce 400 page Ages and Sydney Morning Herald. They're now 200. An Age and a Sydney Morning Herald double the size. I remember when we put together the Trelora printing plant in the early 90s, we speculated on how on earth in 10 or 15 years time we could distribute 650 page Ages and Sydney Morning Heralds. What you'd give a wheelbarrow for every subscription. I mean it was literally that was the way it was going and we built those plants so that you could put another press on the front and another press on the front and another press on the front. And as I said, they spewed out hundreds of thousands of papers and millions and millions of dollars. As I say, heady days, easy days. And then came, of course, the internet. I went to Silicon Valley in the, the mid-90s to, to see for myself what this was all about. And a couple of young Indian guys, for those who you don't know, Indians with its extraordinary mathematics education has provided, provides about a third of, uh, of mathematicians and engineers in Silicon Valley. A couple of Indian guys showed me how you could use the internet to search the classifieds. And it was there in black and white and it wasn't ink. This was the end of a 160 year old business model. Not a change, not an adjustment, not a tweak or a twiddle, the end, nada. And of course, as it became clear that the internet not merely created a plethora of new channels with which to distribute news and information, but cut into media companies' revenue by lowering barriers to entry, concerns set in. Well, in fact, in some quarters, it was panic. Who on earth was going to pay for the journalism? And people, mostly journalists, were asking about their future. The fact was that once you needed a 100-plus-year-old brand and a $250 million printing press in each city, to play the classified game. Now all you needed was a $10,000 website, a rich father, a smattering of maths, and no risk aversion. Sitting on my side of the desk in Fairfax in the late 1990s, it was a critical time for the industry that had not seen any fundamental change to its business model for more than a century. And the question we asked is, did you have to destroy your business to save it? Now, in Australia, we got it half right. We saved the journalism, but we failed to completely secure the old business. We at least put our journalism up online quickly. This was a critical call, and it is worthwhile remembering how early we made it. We launched our digital business in 1995 with smh.com and theage.com.au. Think about it, that's less than two years after the World Wide Web went live. We were building this business before many competitors had even given their employees internet access and email. To give you some perspective, that's two years before Google and years before, years before our major competitor News Limited went online. We were the first Australian news websites and the most successful, a position we continue to hold. It certainly differentiated ourselves from our American counterparts, where online news media leadership was captured by others, such as Yahoo, CNN and the television networks. We did not run or hide from the internet. We embraced it and put 
controversially our journalism on the net for free. And by doing that, we effectively moved a large print audience into a much larger digital audience. This was the magic move. It delivered for us the potential for a long, prosperous post-print future that I will outline in a moment. It is well documented that we pretty much dropped the ball in keeping the classified business. Now, in retrospect, it's easy to roll your eyes and wonder on earth what was going on. Wasn't this a no-brainer? Well, consider this dilemma. Once the fixed costs were met, the profit margin on print classifieds was 70 per cent. So that means 70 cents in every dollar dropped to your profit line. Yet here was a technology, the internet, that required you to deliberately cannibalise your children and make less money, 20 per cent, if you were lucky. So what seemed the reasonable call at the time was that you tried to do both. You tried to defend the past and engage the future. Well, we did well in real estate and we remain in the game in jobs and cars. But by and large, newspaper companies' defensive tactics did not work and along came Seek, along came car sales in the US, along came Craigslist. And it was a fair question to ask of a company like Fairfax, which even 10 years ago had 65 per cent of its revenues dependent upon those classifieds, how it could hope to survive. In Fairfax alone, we have 3,000 editorial staff sniffing around, lifting the lid, asking the questions no one's once asked. That's the job. It's expensive. And dare I say, it's not easy to construct a business model around, no, around annoying the hell out of people. So the question was, wasn't an experienced and professional fourth estate so critical in making sure the power structures in our community were made accountable about to fall and be replaced with a fragmented, undifferentiated world of blogs where loud and raucous advocacy rules? And Woody Allen once said that 90% of life was showing up. And my father once told me that 50% of problems resolve themselves. And the media is made up of some of the smartest, most resilient people on earth. So I must say I was never particularly concerned. I was always a believer in the power of journalism, its capacity to adapt, and the community's, accept community's acceptance that it was a fundamental requirement for a civil society. The issue, issue was straightforward. Could the traditional newspaper-based media company remake its business model? Now, there are still some people out there who still think this is an issue, but it is an old story, and as I have said before, it's asking the wrong question. The fact is, this business model is being remade, and here is why. This is the way Fairfax operates. And in a nutshell, and I'll take you through it in a bit of detail, what we do, as I said, is we produce journalism, and with that journalism, we create audiences and we sell those audiences. We get 85% of our revenue from advertising and another 15% from subscriptions, cover prices, and we drive our traffic to our digital business. You put up the top of that, you could put up any newspaper or any publication or any masthead in our business. So let's just put the age up the top. The age is a masthead. It's been around for 160 years. It produces journalism and it distributes that journalism through print, through online, through smartphones and tablets, and through IPTV. Now, those who don't know what IPTV is, it's Internet Protocol Television. It's a web-enabled television. We have done deals with LG and Samsung and Sony and Panasonic, and the app that you, we put on the iPad, we put on IPTV. 
all new televisions, most new televisions that are being sold now are internet protocol television. So what we do is that we distribute that journalism from our journalists in any manner and any form. We do it through print, so people in the morning can engage us with print. We do it online. The online audience is somewhat different. They're younger and they access us at work, on the desk, when they get to work, at lunchtime, at the end of the day. Smartphones and, and, and iPads, we had 300,000 downloads on our iPad, a couple of million on the smartphone. We can deliver news and journalism anywhere anybody is. If they've got a smartphone, you can get it. If you've got an iPad, you can get it. And we can deliver it to you on the move, and we do it also at home on IPTV. And we get money from that because we create these large cross-platform audiences, and that's how we make our money. Circulation sub and subs, advertising, digital transactions. We're also selling. Once upon a time, we used to sell advertising, just print, just online. We completely restructure the company and we go to advertisers and we give them a complete solution. Here's a, a bit of print, some online, iPad, etc. And as technology moves and as the NBN rolls fast broadband through, these technologies just become more accessible and our ability to sell through, the, through this system improves markedly. And also, I'll tell you what we're also doing, we're cutting costs, and we make no bones about it. To produce the newspaper costs, the major mastheads, half a billion a year in printing and production costs, half a billion a year. We are deliberately reducing our footprint. The old model in classifieds meant that we want as many papers out there as possible, so the advertising, advertisers don't want that many papers. They, if they're in New South Wales and most of the advertisers are in Sydney, they're not interested in, ad, in, in um, people reading the paper in Dubbo or other places in New South Wales. What they're interested in is people reading it in Sydney. And the beauty of this technology is that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, in New South Wales, in Victoria, you can access us through smartphone or iPad. So technology is enabling us to reduce our costs and reinvest those savings in our journalism because that is what we do. And the question we're asking is when our critics are going to wake up and accept and understand that while the old model and the old print classified model might be dead, we have a new one and it's working. Now some facts. Fairfax has a greater readership than it's ever had before. We have 6.7 million unduplicated users across our websites. At the very peak of newspaper circulation back in the 80s, we might have had 2 million. We've got 6.7 million, up 30% in, in five years. Way larger than the good old days, or so-called good old days 30 years ago. And the naysayers say, well, the problem with this, Greg, is that you actually can't get the revenue out of print and put it online. But what's happening is that the print prices of advertising last year rose 2%. Online, they rose 16%. And why, are they, why did they rise 16%? Because people want, advertisers want that audience. They want that audience and it doesn't matter to them whether they access that audience in print or online. Why? Because they know our, our readers engage. Now, there's always a talk, there's talk about circulation. All circulation is, and reductions is, that more people are accessing our journalism in a different way than in print and it's been reflected in circulation reductions. That is to be expected. Tracking and fussing around print circulation is outdated and nearly irrelevant form of measurement. 
Today, it's about readership and what drives it and who the readers are. And if you think, as I said, that readership sounds like people reading physical newspapers, think again. The idea that circulation is the beginning and end of understanding how a masthead is travelling just doesn't cut it anymore. The real statistics tell a powerful story. The new delivery platforms, apps for smartphones and tablets are achieving astonishing penetration. Two million Fairfax apps have been downloaded on smartphones, 300,000 for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age alone on iPads. SMH.com.au is the, the nation's leading digital masthead, topping 3 million readers in September. The Age website has 2.3 million. Importantly, they're not only attracting our readers, they're finding plenty that interests them. Visitors to SMH.com.au spent more than 40, 45 minutes on average on the site during the month of September. Media buyers and planners understand it, and as I said, online ads are rising faster than print. Now, we're talking about journalism here, but the big issue for journalism and the big issue for the last decade or so has been how do we pay for journalism? The old model is gone. What's the new model? This is the new model. And the power of the new model is that we capture people all through the day. All through the day. Not just at a paper in the morning that's rolled up and thrown in the bin, all through the day. This is a powerful model for advertisers who want this audience, will pay for this audience, and that allows us to pay for the journalism. Now, in this crowded, chaotic environment, we still have something to sell. And what we have is the best independent news and analysis all the time, all through the day. And it's all about trust. Now, I'll get back to some other points around this in a bit, but I just want to uh, pause a bit and just talk a bit about the media inquiry, because frankly, it's not issues of business model that really are the threats to journalism. It's really the continue, continue issues of political interference. Now, in the context of this lecture, these comments will date quickly, but I offer them in the context of history, in case in the distant future a deliverer of this lecture is researching past contributions. And all I can say to my successors is, yes, it's a consistent theme the government is trying its best to restrict press freedom. As, you, as this room knows better than most, we live in an age where opinions can be formed, disseminated, digested and possibly twisted in moments of fast-flowing streams of tweets. The fast new ways of communicating are satisfying or even perhaps feeding a latent public hunger for greater engagement with political and policy developments. And personally, the more engaged we are, the better the outcomes for society, community and country. The challenge we face as a community and as a media industry is to foster this public engagement with the issues of the day while ensuring that the exchange of ideas taking place in the blog sphere is a constructive contributor to the democratic process. I believe, and I will say it again and again, we all play a critical role as trusted sources of fact and comment in meeting this challenge. It is, a, it is professional independent journalism and expert comment crafted, edited and curated by professional media operators that provides the foundation to the new platforms for debate, setting the agenda as it has for so long. Our strict structural separation of editorial from advertising activities is key to the way in which we do business. But our commitment to dealing with public interest considerations in a responsible and ethical way extends further to the codes of conduct that we require our employees to honour, our fact-checking processes and our rigorous approach to complaints handling. 
The best defence we have to a free and rigorous press is not some government-funded regulatory regime that has the potential to be pushed and prodded and bullied into curtailing what we do, which is asking questions people in power do not want to be asked. Our best defence is to have our publications edited and led by the sort of people who lead them now, experienced professionals who have spent a lifetime, a lifetime, balancing out a cacophony of competing interests and defining a fair-minded news coverage and multifaceted commentary. While any system can be improved, we believe that the core attributes of the current regime, under which journalists have the freedom to report any issue without fear or favour, is as fundamental to our strong democracy today as at previous, any previous times. I don't think I need to spell out the dangers that may emerge if this ever ceased to be the case. Now, excuse me. In closing, I'd like to make, I'd like to share a couple of quotes from a fellow called Chris Anderson. Chris Anderson is the editor in chief of Wired magazine. <coughs> These quotes are from a piece he wrote that was included in an article called The Web is Dead, Long Live the Internet. Now, Chris is not just a geek. Before joining Wired in 2001, he worked at The Economist, where he launched the magazine's coverage of the internet. He has a degree in physics from George Washington University, did research at Los Alamos National Laboratory. These quotes are from October 2010, and they are only more relevant today. He is talking about how the power has shifted from the web to the internet. Now, note the distinction here. The web is the search function of the internet. It's the search function of the internet. The internet delivers a fuller delivery functionality. On the internet, you can not just search, you can deliver content, you can transact, you can buy and sell. It's a much more powerful technology than just searching. Now, this is what Chris Anderson said. He said, now it's the web's turn to face the pressure for profits and the walled gardens that bring them. Openness is a wonderful thing in the non-monetary economy of peer production. But eventually our tolerance for the delirious chaos of infinite competition finds its limits. Much as we love freedom of choice, we also love things that just work reliably and seamlessly. And if we have to pay for what we love, well, that seems increasingly OK. He concluded saying, the internet is the real revolution, as important as electricity. What we do with it is still evolving. As it moved from your desktop to your pocket, the nature of the net changed. The delirious chaos of the open web was an adolescent phase subsidised by industrialised giants groping their way around a new world. Now they're doing what industrialists industrialists love best, finding choke points. And by the looks of it, we're loving it. So amid the proliferation of new brands and new technologies brought by the internet, Facebook, Apple, Google, stand the supposed dinosaurs. The, news, the traditional newspaper-based companies and publications, like Fairfax, like News Limited in Australia, like the New York Times, like the Wall Street Journal, the Times of London, the Guardian, the Financial Times, etc. Out of fashion at best, destined to die, say the cynics. Yet the point Chris Anderson is making, and the point I have been making tonight as the CEO of one of these companies, is that the world is, is changing dramatically in our favour. For what we do is what we have always done and for what there will always be a healthy market. We provide solutions for our audiences. 
What's our solution? We help our audience understand the world. The world is out there, there's a lot of lot happening, and for the case of the Sydney Morning Herald, for 180 years, it's taken what's gone on in that world and filtered it down to a digestible form for its audience. We help people understand the world. Every day we put thousands of journalists to work to find out what is going on. Via face-to-face -face interviews, observing court proceedings, telephone conversations, we draw information from a vast variety of sources, traditional media, Reuters, The New York Times, Bloomberg, televised media and social media. We take commentary and analysis from outside contributors. We filter it down into a visually digestible and time appropriate form so that, that our audience knows out of all that madness out there what is going on. We do so under brands that have been around for some cases for well in excess of 150 years and bring with them trust and reliability. Yet somehow amid the debate about the future of media, the decline of print has become a metaphor for a crisis of journalism. What nonsense. While there may be some romantic notions around print, the smell of ink, the art of its practitioners, print is merely a delivery technology. And we all know that technology never stays the same. For the vast majority of life, of the life of man, for tens of thousands of years, the technology of journalism was the human voice. It was just storytelling. Then came handwriting, the laborious crafting of books accessible only by a super elite. And then print came, which democratised learning for the last half millennium. And the last past hundred years has seen electronic forms of communication proliferate. First, the very basic telegraph, then the telephone, radio, television, and then in the 1990s, its most profound manifestation, the internet. As Philip Knightley told the Melbourne Press Club in 2002, sometime in the 90s, for the first time in the history of mankind, the supply of information exceeded the demand. That brings with it, that sort of change brings with it revolutions. So to this point, that internet technology, which we use, which is the heart of our business, which is the heart of, the, which is the heart of journalism, it's how we do it now, we can deliver that journalism on a plethora of hardware, desktops, tops, laptops, tablets, smartphones, IPTVs, and in any manner of applications, apps through Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, who knows what's next? It doesn't really matter. And of course, globally, there have been many great media companies who failed to make the transition. There always is. Fairfax Media, is not and will not be one of them. And I doubt whether News Limited will be one of them. My premise tonight has been that the future of newspapers is not the question people should be asking. Equally, the future role of journalism should not be questioned. Independent, trusted and valued journalism and journalists has never been more important. And it is the core and future success of my company, which I'm proud to lead. We have zero doubt about it. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much, Greg Highwood. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Margaret Simons. Um, I am the director of the Centre for Advanced Journalism here at the University of Melbourne, or at least will be from the 1st of December. Uh, my role here tonight is first of all to thank Greg for that riveting address, and secondly to chair a brief question and answer session. Now we have two microphones here with the ushers. Um, I would ask questioners to wait till the microphone reaches them so that we can all hear you. Um, do I have uh, somebody who wishes to open the batting? Uh, the gentleman there? You just... 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg, for the, for the lecture. It was very, very interesting. Um, I work for an organization called Newsdesk, which brokers citizen journalism to the mainstream media. I was very fascinated that you never mentioned citizen journalism as the future of, of, of journalism. I just want to know where you, where you saw the importance of citizen journalism in the future of journalism. And if it is as important as its, as its proliferation seems to suggest, do you think that it's time that it should be brought in from the cold and actually paid for? Uh, I'm a great supporter of citizen journalism. I'm a great supporter of journalism in any, in, in any form and the freedom of expression that, that, that goes with it. Uh, and citizen journalism has been brought about fundamentally by the things that uh, I've been talking about tonight, which is it's been brought ar around, it's been democratised uh, by the internet. If it wasn't for the internet, citizen journalism in its, would not have the ability to interact the way it does, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Thanks. I've, I've never worked in the media, so I won't try and give you any advice, but I used to be a newspaper right. junkie. That's unusual. <laughs> um, I used to get subscribed to and read three newspapers a day, and I must confess, even weeklies like The Truth and the Turak Times. Yeah, tragic. Good but idea. some years ago, I found that too much of the daily papers was a repetition of what was in the TV news the night before. And I'd struggle to find an article. I'd come across, oh, that was on <coughs> Channel 2 last night. I'm like, no need to read that. So I'm down now just to the age. And I nearly cancelled that a little while back. It got so bland. But they've improved, and they are now covering it. exclusives. And there is some investigative journalism. And there is something that you don't see elsewhere. Yeah. And you bring that's it to why a I'm question? happy to pay you bring and it to buy a, a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> you know what his question is. <laughs> compliments to you for that. This environment that I've been talking about is a much more demanding environment. People do have information coming at them from a variety of different forms all the time. And quite clearly, you have to know, as a media outlet, as a publication, exactly what market you want and what that market needs and you have to serve that market well. And if you're in a market and you need uh, original material and not material that is, that is basically um, uh, regurgitated from last night's news, that publication has been failing you and it's good to see that it's, it's lifted its game. But that is the world that we live in and you will not survive unless you know your market unless you meet your market's needs, and when I mean meeting the market's needs, delivering the sort of things that you want, which is the sort of things that you don't know that you need, that you don't know that you know, um, and that takes you further as a person than you would otherwise have been if you hadn't had that information. There's a gentleman there in the green shirt and then down here. Donovan Gregg, best of luck with your leadership with Fairfax. Thank you very much. Uh, the question I'm asking is, you mentioned that Trevor Sykes um, said he'd sack you if you went to a uh, journalism course at RMIT. Mm. I'd just be interested in your thoughts on what you see as the value of journalism uh, courses in universities at present, and also as compared with the in-house training that, the, uh, that Fairfax do, or I presume will continue to do, mm. uh, either as trainees uh, or cadets, or do you see them, uh, the two operations combining? The, uh, so I think the academic training is, is valuable. The in-house training is enormously valuable. Uh, but also the, uh, the type of person, I mean, and it's one thing, and I, it's, I always come back to what makes a good journalist and what doesn't make a good journalist. And I think training is, is critically important. You've also got to be prepared to be a certain sort of person. Um, and and there's, not everyone can do it. You've actually got to be prepared not to be liked, in fact. And not many people are prepared not to be liked. Most people really like to be liked. But if you're a journalist, you have to ask people questions that they do not want to be asked. And these can be very powerful people who can bully and cajole and push back very hard. And uh, you have to have the resilience to do that. 
and uh, it's, a, it's a valuable component. So ultimately, and you know, I don't know whether you can train people to do this, it's a personality type, it's a, it's a willingness to put yourself in that situation again and again and again. You've got to pick that phone up, confront the person and not be prepared to be liked. Uh, in that context, if you're that sort of person, uh, the more training internally and externally that you can have can only make you better at what you do. Yeah. Next question is just here. Greg, um, can I ask about paywalls? Uh, what do they do to the business model that you're describing here as being so successful? And I'm obviously asking that in reference to your competitor, News Limited, which has decided to put a lot more emphasis on putting content behind paywalls than Fairfax. Yeah, well, if you saw what I set up there, uh, we get 85% of our revenue from advertising. So what you do when you put up a paywall is re you reduce access. I mean, the, the, the internet is an enormously powerful competitive tool, and it's a cliche that your competition is only a click away. They are. If you don't, you know, if, if you bought the wrong paper, you'd have to go all the way back to the news agent to get the next one. You're sitting at your desk, you just go click. So therefore, the competitive environment is is critical. So you, what we're about is creating as many of our audience as we can. Um, if there's some content that we believe that uh, uh, people will pay for, uh, we will pay for that. But we're in let's just say, um, the mid to late stages of working through exactly what we're doing here. There's no first mover advantage. It's not like the classified business where there was first mover advantage. We'll determine um, which content has paywalls around it in the context of how much advertising revenue we want vis-a-vis -vis how much um, upfront revenue we want. Uh, we've had experience. The Financial Review has the world's largest paywall. Um, and uh, we believe that that was uh, badly overcooked and restricted the number of people to the point where we couldn't create an advertising, an effective advertising business. So uh, somewhere between the Fin Review and Zero is where people will, uh, is, will fit. But I wouldn't rule out not having them. I wouldn't rule out not having them. Given how relatively expensive investigative journalism is, um, and with what we've seen in News of the World, for example. Um, where do you see the tensions between that kind of journalism and the business model of, of media or, or newspapers? Oh, well, investigative journalism is, to the gentleman's point here, the sort of material that you want more of. I mean, you know, that, um, that is that sort of exclusive material, that sort of material that, uh, that lifts the lid, gives people insights, is the sort of material that uh, people have always craved and always adds value. So it fits perfectly here. I mean, what each of the, our publications, each of our mastheads has to do is differentiate themselves in exclusive material that gives that of, of considerable depth is of great value. Mm. OK. So we've got time for just one more question, and it's the gentleman up there in the back row. Thank you. <laughs> Is that coming through? Yes. I'm very interested, I having been in education and now an 80 year older, I look back over the history of transition and what I've observed over those years is that everything filters down to a younger age group and minds increase and they use every facility available. It seems after looking at the year 12 exhibits of the work they do, studies, etc that our kids are almost up to the stage of producing anything at any time to influence government and the rest of society. Where will the cut-off point be? Will education be locked down and stop the expansion of minds? Or will journalism grow to a higher level than it is at present? Kids who wrote the program called Inside Woomera and put it on the internet changed the government and its attitude to the migrants they had locked up there. These kids are learning and developing skills that we cannot lock down. They're expanding, and as their minds expand, where will the future be in terms of locking into place an economic model for journalism? 
Well, it's just I a small one. I don't know how to reply to that. Um, the, the, quite clearly, no one, my view is, no one wants to lock anything down. And the, 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 what you have with the technologies available is that you know the, the printing the printing plant was not as exclusive as the handwritten book, uh, uh, but it's certainly not as dem democratic as the internet. So the degree to which people can get on top of a technology, use it to express their views, use them to express them in a in an effective manner, um, all power to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we we're certainly not in in any sense. Um, Locking that down, we only can we can only encourage all sorts of investigations by people young or old. There's, and frankly, sir, there's no um, problem with 80-year-olds doing that either. <laughs> well, that's a, a good note to end on. I think if you just join me again in thanking Greg Highwood for the speech.